Previously on Transformers University, we talked about some of the ancillary media surrounding the Transformers boom of 1985, and now we're going to talk a little bit about some of that media that came out of the UK. We're talking the Ladybird books portion of 1985 and the talk and read audiobooks that go with them right now on Transformers University. Hello, my friend, and welcome to episode 38 of Transformers University. I am your host, Anthony Brucalli, and I want to thank you for waiting out the delay uh, between this episode and the previous episode. Uh, uh, if you're unaware, if you are not following TFU.info on social media, particularly on Twitter, at TFU underscore info, uh, then you don't know that just recently uh, I became a dad for the first time. So uh, I have welcomed my daughter into the world, Cassidy, uh, and my wife and I love her very much. And that is why uh, this episode and probably the next few episodes might take a little longer to get to your ears. Uh, So I want to thank you for bearing with me and my family as we uh, celebrate this time, but, uh, and for being so understanding in, uh, the show's production schedule being a little interrupted. Uh, That said, I also want to welcome to the show and to the Patreon uh, my good friend Dave from D-Squared Productions. Uh, Dave has joined the Patreon, patreon.com slash TFU info, at the senior level, and uh, I am just so thrilled to have him on. You may remember Dave from all the way back in episode 11 where he cut a rap song about heavy metal war and uh he is one of my oldest friends i actually talked about him on one of the patreon exclusive uh podcasts about my experiences at new york comic-con this year uh he and i spent a little time together had some fun uh, around the con but for that you're gonna have to join the patreon along with dave um but enough housekeeping we are going to get into some history today and today we are talking about the ladybird books these were published uh, in great britain uh, by a company called ladybird books and uh, these kind of exist in their own small uh, continuity within g1 Uh, they're kind of a world unto themselves and uh, they were published from 1985 through 1988 and they are certainly a unique take on the Transformers now. They're not so far out there as the kids' stuff recordings we did way back in episode 25. Uh, but they do have their unique moments. Uh, they feature art uh, and they feature words. And there are actually recorded audio versions of these that you can find on YouTube on a channel called Retro Robot Radio. Uh, and I use those to uh, hunt these down and kind of read along with them. Uh, and I think... You'll appreciate some of this as well. Now, that these were written by an author, a children's author named John Grant, a uh, Scottish children's author, famous for the series Little Nose. Um, and he passed away a few years ago. I actually had to update his TF Wiki entry uh, for that. Uh, also, art by Marvel UK artist uh, Mike Collins. You may know a little bit better from episode 16 when we talked about the second half of Man of Iron. Uh, inks by Mark Farmer. Mark Farmer. I'm ready. And we're going to talk about the first book, Autobots Lightning Strike. Now, before we get into the book, uh, all of these audio versions feature an introduction basically explaining the Autobots crash on Earth and another new version of the Transformers theme song. And this one's another synth version. And here, give it a listen.
Now, along with the synth version of the theme song, one of the interesting things I found off the top here is that the human friend of the Autobots is Spike, not Buster, despite it being a uh, Marvel UK artist drawing this book. Uh, he is a young engineer, and just like in the original cartoon miniseries, he does keep a journal. We also have Spike's father throughout these books, and he is referred to as Spike's father the entire time, not as Sparkplug, though I may switch back and forth and call him Sparkplug by accident, so just a heads up there. Uh, the Autobots in this story uh, are freaked out by a lightning storm. Uh, these things are apparently unknown on Cybertron. Who knew? Um, and if that's the case then where does Thundercracker get his name from? Because that makes no sense. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Thundercracker does not appear in at least these handful of books that we're talking about. But uh, if he does, I've just completely forgotten. Um, in the story, Spike's father teaches the uh, dangers of lightning to the Autobots. And then uh, the Autobots still looking to build a ship to go home. So Optimus Prime enlists Huffer to catch some lightning. As usual, Huffer complained. Lightning? He muttered. Catch it? You want it put in a cage, I suppose? So, interesting thing in this part of the story as Huffer is trying to uh, ride the lightning, there's a page that's miscolored in the printing process, and Huffer is uh, color flipped from orange and blue to blue with orange, and Gears is a green olive kind of color and brown instead of his red and blue. So Huffer builds this device, the lightning collector. And of course, Laserbeak is spying and reports back to the Decepticons. And there's some very odd voices here. I make the decisions, snapped Megatron. Soundwave, Laserbeak will lead you to the place. Keep a listening watch. This creation of theirs may be very useful to us. I still say that we should destroy it, said Starscream. If I were leader, the last Autobot would have long since been reduced to a handful of rusting nuts and bolts. So, a couple things I've noticed about the voices here is that Megatron sounds more like cartoon Starscream. And Starscream, he is taking his name very, very literally, uh, screaming basically every line he has. Soundwave is sent to find this lightning collector and tells Megatron about it. And uh, there's some really cool uh, toyetic art in this book. And Blue Streak with this really freakish face that I'll be sure to tweet out and send out on the social media because uh, that is a, just a bizarre look for Blue Streak. Uh, it's noted that Laserbeak returns uh, to... Decepticon base at one point and transforms into, quote, his other disguise. Um, so if that's his other disguise, then his bird form is also a disguise? Or does he have a third um, mode that we're just not known or privy to? Uh, Megatron needs to know what the thing the Autobots are building is. The one thing that I probably didn't point out is that he has they, nobody has any idea what the Lightning Collector is or does from the Decepticon standpoint. Um, because nobody on that side of the story knows what lightning is. So uh, Megatron is basically having a meltdown because <laughs> he wants to know what the Autobots are doing. Um, and so Megatron goes to find out, and Starscream and Rumble, the red one, are off uh, doing something else. Uh, Megatron scrambles the... Decepticons, and that's kind of a neat little thing here, is uh, they use Decepticon scramble as kind of the catchphrase, like Autobots transform and roll out. Um, and that's kind of something from the first couple of episodes of the original cartoon uh, that never really caught on uh, throughout the series. So eventually, there's a storm coming, and Rumble, the red one, and Starscream sneak into the base uh, that has the lightning co uh, conductor. Now, the lightning conductor, I probably should explain this too, is in a mountainside, uh, underneath the mountainside, kind of, or hillside. And uh, it rises up out of the ground. And the Decepticons have seen this. They don't know what it is, but they decide to sneak in to find out uh, Starscream and Rumble, the red one. And uh, as this happens, Megatron arrives and 
realizes Starscream's uh, treachery, because Starscream was going to go in there and just blow the whole thing up. And as that's going on, the uh, <laughs> lightning collector it gets hit by lightning, and most of the Decepticons are injured being inside the mountain while it was collecting lightning. Uh, Megatron, for some reason, still thinks it's a radio receiver, and <laughs> they basically get electrocuted. Another thing worth noting in here is that Ravage, at one point in the story, is called a mechanical hound. Ravage is a cat, not a hound. Uh, so John Grant had a real hard time, and he did this more than once, believing this character was a cat and not a dog. Uh, an actual hound, ja and uh, the Autobot hound, and Jazz, uh, they sum up everything pretty succinctly. I thought that I picked up their signals when they first arrived, said Hound. But I wasn't sure. It seems that they thought our energy collector was a radio transmitter. They were trying to discover its secrets. Well, they certainly got the message, said Jazz. And one quick last thing to note about this one. Hound, uh, his voice has a bit of a New York accent, much like mine. And Jazz, for whatever reason, sounds like an old prospector. Um, I mean, specifically, like, the old prospector from the line at uh, the Great Thunder Mountain in Walt Disney World. Howdy, folks. Please keep your hands and arms inside the train and remain seated at all times. Now then, hang on to them hats and glasses, because this here's the wildest ride in the wilderness. That takes us to Lady Bird Book 2, Megatron's fight for power same creative team actually same creative team throughout all of these and later on we'll actually find out that uh steve whitaker did the colors on these books now once again we start with spike writing in his diary and the autobots still repairing their ship and megatron is drawn here and he has one hell of a chin uh it is like jay leno-esque chin in fact i will uh throw that up on the social medias as well at Decepticon base, Megatron, not happy uh, that the Energon cubes are empty, and uh, Soundwave sends out Buzzsaw uh, to search for a source of power. Uh, he is ordered to search something in a search radius of 500 kilometers and find something uh, just outside of this radius. Now, Megatron and... Soundwave go to inspect what Buzzsaw has found, and Starscream once again plans a coup. At the edge of the search radius, uh, a professor and a driver enter a solar energy uh, station. Chinatron and Soundwave decide to, uh, they're going to take over this uh, solar energy station, and Megatron has his orders. Decepticons to solar complex. 32.5 kilometers from base, on bearing 2, 3, 4 degrees, assemble at building in center of complex. Now, how is this at the edge of 500 kilometers, uh, if it's that short of a ride? Your guess is good as mine. But Starscream enacts a plan to overthrow Megatron and orders Rumble uh, the red one to assemble other Decepticons. Uh, back at Autobot base, Ironhide is relaxing in the countryside and picks up these Decepticon signals and tells the rest of the Autobots. Optimus takes Spike and his father to the solar station. But at the solar station, Starscream feels he has the drop on Megatron and will shoot him immediately as he comes out of the solar station but Megatron foils that plan and sneaks up to on Starscream from behind and says this did you really think that I would sit alone to await your pleasure shortly after that Optimus Spike Spike's dad and Roller enter the complex planning to destroy the Energon cubes Spike attempts to break into the central building, but it is locked in. Roller smuggles him a sonar multi-tool to 
pick the lock. Uh, Spike points the solar-powered dish at the cubes and blows them up, and the Decepticons flee. And I know there's some flawed logic there somewhere, but uh, I like the idea of a sonar multi-tool. Like, it's just uh, a leather man with, uh, with some sonic power to it. All right, on to book number three. This one's called Autobots Fight Back. Uh, were they not before? And uh, it is by the same team of creators. Uh, in this one, Bumblebee is sent on a spy mission. And once again, this art is very toyetic. But an uh, interesting note here is that Bumblebee is noted to have supervision. And that goes back to some of the source material that must have been given to the Marvel folks. Because that is all over the Marvel coloring books and it's not really anywhere else but the coloring books and kind of the ancillary media in relation to uh, 84 and 85. Now on his spy mission Bumblebee finds the Decepticons arguing in this book Soundwave speaks in all caps and while spying on the Decepticons Bumblebee is caught. Bumblebee fled with the Decepticons in hot pursuit. He raced back along the narrow tunnel and scrambled down the rocks as fast as he could go. On level ground, he transformed to his Volkswagen shape and raced off at top speed in a cloud of dust. I find it interesting that the narrator says Volks, Volkswagen there. From there, the Decepticons decide to, quote, activate Ravage, and he has quite the weird sounds coming out of him. <sighs> Now, Bumblebee's got to escape Ravage, and once again, John Grant, the writer, calls him a canine, even though he's a cat, and uh, Bumblebee escapes by flashing bright light onto Ravage. Another thing that goes back to some of the early source material, pretty much is only seen in uh, the early episodes of More Than Meets the Eye. It might be on his tech spec, I don't remember, but uh, Ravage's sensitivity to light is brought into play here, and is what... Uh, delays him enough for Bumblebee to escape, but after he escapes, Ravage discovers a train tunnel, and um, <laughs> he doesn't know what it is, uh, much like how the Autobots didn't know what lightning was. So what the, the Decepticons are arguing about early in the book is basically that uh, they need to build an ion drive to power their ship to get off the planet, but they don't have a space big enough to build said ion drive. Now, if they demolish a space big enough, to build the ion drive they will burn through all the energon cubes that they have which they need to power the ion drive uh, it turns out this tunnel that ravage discovers is actually a good place to build an ion drive so uh they do and the decepticons check it out and soundwave believes that the tracks that uh, feed into this cave are some sort of crude uh quote energy conductor system meanwhile back at autobot base um, Bumblebee and Trailbreaker debate Ion Drive versus Neutron Drive. So, it seems the Decepticons are having problems with their Ion Drive, he said. More trouble than they're worth, said Trailbreaker. Give me good old-fashioned Neutron Drive every time. This should keep Megatron and company grounded for a long time to come. Of course it's Neutron Drive. What are you, some kind of idiot? Really? Uh, the bots decide to monitor the Decepticons, uh, mainly Trailbreaker and Hound. And uh, it's also interesting to note in these books that Spike is kind of drawn differently every time. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll put together an, an image of that as well. And during the scene, we find out Ironhide's uh, true function. I'm built for carrying groceries, and I enjoy a trip into town. <laughs> I guess... Ironhide sure likes packing his rear. Hey, you guys, said Ironhide as they packed more goods inside him. Ever think of going on a diet? It would do you good, and it would sure take some of the strain off my suspension. So, the Autobots use a car rally in Oregon to sneak up on this Decepticon construction uh, initiative, uh, if you will call it that, and Jazz will be the one to enter this race. Um as they uh, head off to this car rally, Optimus' vehicle mode is referred to as, and I quote, 
an articulated truck. Uh, <laughs> and I am going to send you off to do some homework. Uh, and it's one of the early, I'd say it's the first three or four episodes of my friend Rob Springer's podcast, uh, Being Awesome with Rob Springer, which you can find over at the uh, Radio Free Cybertron Network, tfradio.net. Uh, he tells a great story that about uh, a, a highly articulated Optimus Prime toy uh, that I was lucky enough to be around for. And uh, I don't want to take anything away from it. So that is your homework today, class. Now back to the story. Jazz uh, drops Spike off at the railway and the bots decide to invade the tunnel. They attack. Now as this attack goes on, Spike has a plan and Jazz and Spike head up the hill to fetch some quarry wagons and push them down the tracks, destroying everything. And thus, the Decepticons are defeated. Finally, we get to book four, uh, the final book of 1985 for the Ladybird books, and that is called Laser Beaks Fury. Uh, and this is the one where we find out that Steve Whitaker is the colorist. I'm going to say he's been the colorist all along. Uh, I don't know how true that is, though. But given the rest of the team has been consistent throughout, I would guess that Steve Whitaker, uh, being a Marvel UK colorist, was probably the colorist on this as well. Once again, Megatron, he wants some power. Uh, and he plans to use the humans against the Autobots. And Starscream in this story has a new voice. I say exterminate them, said Starscream. This miserable planet would be all the better for being rid of those floppy human beings. Now, Laserbeak is sent to observe the humans and Starscream, not happy with this plan, uh, believes that Megatron is uh, getting a little soft. I am old because I am hard! <laughs> and I know, that's, that's a fun line to quote. Uh, uh, one of the more interesting things in here is also that Laserbeak has a voice as well. Investigating unidentified objects. And at that moment, he hit the overhead power lines to the farm. And in this story, uh, since we kind of have a theme here of Autobots and Decepticons not knowing what things on Earth are, Laserbeak does not know what power lines are, and uh, he gets electrocuted by them uh, and is forced to transform into tape mode where he is then stuck. Um, he's trying to report back on what he's seen. The Autobots have intercepted this transmission before it uh, gets blown out by electricity and both the Autobots and Decepticons trying to figure out what Laserbeak had seen. Uh, the farmer's kid finds Laserbeak and uh, the kid's mom puts the tape in the car for the village dance. Hound and Spike, they meet up at a windmill, uh, which is what Laserbeak saw. He saw a windmill and Optimus forms a battle unit, including Cliffjumper in yellow. This is possibly the only fictional appearance of the yellow Cliffjumper toy. And the Autobots reach the windmill. Uh, I think it's kind of neat that there is a yellow Cliffjumper in here. I'm not going to lie. That's, that makes that toy so much better for me now. Um, at the village dance, the DJ, of course, he accidentally inserts Laserbeak into the cassette deck and uh, we get some awesome art as this actually awakens Laserbeak. Uh, he doesn't actually play anything out of the speakers but static but uh, uh, you get this great shadowy version of Laserbeak rising up over a disco dance floor and it's, it's pretty epic. Uh, another thing I will tweet out when I can. The crowd, they do what you're supposed to do. They start shooting at Laserbeak. Uh, somebody had a shotgun uh, in the village and started shooting at Laserbeak. Uh, Laserbeak escapes to the Decepticons on the hill. The Decepticons, they see the Autobots at the windmill. And of course, they want to take it. Uh, despite having zero idea of what it is. And that seems to be the Decepticons' motivation uh, throughout this series of books so far. Is that uh, we don't know what it does, but if the Autobots want it, so do we. Uh, battle ensues and the windmill starts and the Decepticons, they have no idea how to destroy it. Stop that thing! Screamed Megatron. 
Starscream knelt and aimed the null ray projector at the mill. The mill glowed with blue light as the ray hit it, but the machinery rumbled on, and the damaged sail still swung round and round in the moonlight. Impossible! cried Starscream. There is no machine which could withstand the null ray! So Soundwave decides to eject Rumble, the red one, to destroy the mill. The mill falls on the Decepticons and the Autobots win. Uh, and that is the end of Laserbeak's Fury. And that will wrap up this episode of Transformers University. Once again, if you want to support the show, you want to help us out, there's so many ways you can do it. I told you before about the Patreon, patreon.com slash TFU info. I won't tell you anymore, but uh, if you'd like to help out the show in another way, tfu.info slash Amazon. That'll take you to Amazon.com and anything you buy from there on out, uh, Amazon kicks back a few bucks to the show. Of course, you can catch us on Twitter at TFU underscore info and on Facebook facebook.com slash tfu info instagram.com slash tfu info and of course the youtube channel youtube.com slash tfu info please if you're not already subscribed to the youtube channel if you got a gmail address it's all you need uh swing on by sign in and just click subscribe uh be a huge help to me and to this show and i will appreciate you for a very long time next time on the show we are getting back into g1 season two yes it is a long season we're only going to talk about four episodes this time around plus one other thing you may not know existed and you'll have to just wait until the next episode to find out what i am talking about until next time see you